Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 315, Review of Riken and Lefebvre, Our Triune God. This podcast is a follow-up to episode 314, 10 Fundamental Questions About the Trinity. I've always been interested in, quote, the Trinity, not just as a set of speculations batted around by elites, but also as something which is believed by the person in the pew. Back in podcast 302, The Stages of Trinitarian Commitment, I mentioned how most Christians are stuck with basically avoiding the topic. They find it painfully confusing, and any forays they make into trying to sort it out, try to understand what's going on, uh, they just end up butting their head against a wall, and they quit. And they just go back to repeating the common language, or at least tolerating it, and uh, just sort of leaving this to the experts. Now, one thing that an ordinary Christian in the pew would do to try to study their way out of this hole is to pick up a short paperback written by experts with PhDs, which purports to tell them the basics of the Trinity. Maybe they don't want to go through the agonies of interpreting Thomas Aquinas and John Duns Scotus and Richard Swinburne and Peter Van Inwagen on the topic. Look, please just give me the basics, okay? Give it to me in an inexpensive paperback of less than 200 pages. Give me the basics so I can then find my way through all of these confusions. In this and the next couple episodes of the Trinity's podcast, I'm going to review and interact with books which try to fill that niche. They try to serve that role of giving a basic introduction. And I will be concerned with the truth of their answers, but also I'm concerned with how many of the 10 fundamental questions do these books actually give clear answers to How many do they avoid, and how many questions are raised, and yet the reader leaves probably more confused than when they came in? So this book is called Our Triune God, Living in the Love of the Three-in-One. It's kind of trying to be a book on Christian living at the same time as being a basic introduction to the theology of the Trinity, but it's really the theology part that I'm interested in. It's co-authored, and one author is the president of Wheaton College, perhaps the most famous evangelical institution of higher learning in America. His name is Philip Riken. The other author is a Reformed Presbyterian pastor named Michael Lefevre. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that name. I don't mean to. A couple of the ten fundamental questions we can deal with quite easily, but some of the others will require a lot of work on the part of the reader. Now, in the last podcast, I said there were 10 questions, but because the theorist either affirms or denies that the doctrine of the Trinity is in the Bible, then they can ignore one of the questions. So these authors do claim that the Trinity is taught in the Bible, and so the question, if this doctrine is not in the Bible, why should Bible-oriented Protestants accept it? That question is not relevant to them. So there are nine questions remaining. If the book clearly answers all nine, I'll give it a score of nine of nine. One question they do clearly answer is, is this doctrine, as the Athanasian Creed asserts, something which one must believe in order to be saved? And they say, yep, that's right. Sadly, they don't entertain any objections to this. As I mentioned last time, it seems that a lot of common Christian practice presupposes the falsity of this. And it's also hard to square with the book of Acts. People are getting saved in Acts left and right, and these teachings don't appear in Acts. Other questions, I think, they pretty much whiff. They just don't address really at all. One is, is this doctrine consistent with the common conception of God as a mighty, unique, and completely perfect self? They don't ever address this directly, And we'll talk about this more when we discuss their gestures at explaining the meaning of the doctrine of the Trinity. Some things they say sound consistent with this, and other things sound inconsistent with it. Another question is, how does this doctrine relate to the so-called ecumenical councils and their creeds? Well, in the introduction written by Dr. Robert Lethem, there's a gesture at the 381 Council with really no comment on it. 
Deep into the book, our authors write, it is helpful to think of the church's confessions, like the Westminster Confession of Faith, as Bible study notes from past generations. So they're not supposed to replace scripture, they're not infallible, but, you know, they're just handy guides to the Bible. I don't think this is true, because these creeds introduce ideas that I don't think are in the Bible. Their comments here presumably would apply to earlier creeds, but they just don't want to get into ecumenical councils. It seems to me that they want to merely gesture at historically popular creeds, perhaps to kind of partake of their prestige, so that the uh, historical prestige bleeds onto what they're saying. And yet, because they're not really getting into those councils, they don't have to deal with any of their obscurities or the issue of their authority. Ultimately, the reader gets the impression that they are wholly dispensable, right? I can get my Bible study notes elsewhere. Why would I need the Westminster Confession or the Nicene Creed if I have the NIV Study Bible? Those are Bible study notes, and they're more voluminous, and they're probably clearer. So in the end, I think they really take a pass on that question. Another question is, why have some Christians opposed any Trinity doctrine? They completely take a pass on this. If they know anything about it, they're completely uninterested to present it in this book. In the introduction, Robert Lethem mentions, quote, modernist rationalism. What? What's that? Is that something Christians are into? Who knows? So if you're the slightest bit worried about the Trinity and is the Trinity really in the Bible, and what about these arguments that it's not in the Bible, this is not the book for you. You should just move on. Okay, but lots of readers aren't like that, so let's press on. The number one question, and I think the really foundational question, is what is the doctrine of the Trinity? Don't just repeat for me traditional language, but explain to me how that language should be understood. Suppose you go into the book with this truly foundational, fundamental question about, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity. Thinking about this, I couldn't help but remember what Dante's Inferno says is posted on the gates of hell. All hope abandon ye who enter here. Here, here. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> you need to abandon all hope of any clear expression of what the doctrine of the Trinity is supposed to be. Let me explain. So on page 20 of the book, pretty early on, the authors offer up a list of seven propositions. They say, look, this is all the Trinity really amounts to. Ready? One, God the Father is God. Two, God the Son is God. Three, God the Holy Spirit is God. Four, the Father is not the Son. Five, the Son is not the Spirit. Six, the Spirit is not the Father. Seven, nevertheless, there is only one God. Now, what the authors don't seem to realize is that this clarifies things not at all. These are sentences that Trinitarians generally will want to say, but they just can't be offered as an explication of what the doctrine is, because at least six of the seven are just obviously ambiguous. So the statement that someone is God can be taken in at least two different ways. Really, it's more than two, but these are the two most popular ways. One is to take it as a statement of numerical identity. So the Father is God and the Son is God, each in the sense that Mark Twain just is Samuel Clemens, or in the sense that W is President George W. Bush. So if you interpret all the talk of is God in these statements as being statements of numerical identity, then we're told in the first three that each of the persons of the Trinity just is God, and yet those three persons, four, five, and six, say, are different from each other. And that's just demonstrably an impossibility. So if you interpret the talk of is God uniformly as identity, you get the nonsense that the Father is God, the Son is God, and yet the Son is not the Father. But things identical to the same thing are identical to one another. So do they just think that the doctrine fundamentally involves a contradiction? Well, before we answer that, we have to note that a lot of apologists and Christian philosophers will argue that is God should be just taken as saying is divine. It's attributing a property. It's describing the person. Okay, so then one through three amount to the Father's divine, the Son's divine, and the Spirit is divine. And then four, five, and six look like they have to be taken in the sense of numerical identity. It just says the one is not the other, right? Not the same thing as the other. Okay, so Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct. That's what 4, 5, and 6 said. And yet 1, 2, and 3 are now in this interpretation saying that each of those individually is divine. 
All right, well, then there are three things, each of which is divine. But seven says there is only one God. What is a God if not something which is divine? With divinity here, we're talking about having the divine essence, the properties which are necessary and sufficient for being a God. We just said that there are three different things that have the divine essence. That looks like that just entails that there are three gods, but seven says there's only one God. Again, if you interpret one through three as just describing them as having the divine essence, looks like you still have to interpret four, five, and six as being denials of numerical identity, you get an incoherent set of claims. Do they think it's really incoherent? But wait, there's more. There are a couple ways of disambiguating this on which it is coherent, but on these ways, arguably, it's not orthodox. So we could take seven to be saying that there's only one God, like only one divine being. And when we say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, we're just saying that those are mm, ways God is. There are three ways. So the Father is a way God is, the Son is a way God is, and the Spirit is a way God is, four, five, and six. And those are different ways from one another. The Father mode or the Father way is different than the Son way. Okay, yet there's only one God. Okay, so there's a modalist disambiguation on which the seven claims are coherent, but this is arguably against the tradition. There's also a subordinationist disambiguation. If is God doesn't have to mean fully divine, fully having the divine essence in the highest sense, if is God can just mean divine either in the highest way or in a lesser way, then we can say the Father is God, he's the one true God, the Son's God, yeah, the Son is divine in, in a slightly different sense, and so is the Holy Spirit. And the Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father. They really are three things. Each of the three are divine, but only the Father is divine in the way that the one true God is divine, and so that's consistent with seven. Nevertheless, there is only one God. Okay, so the subordinationist interpretation makes the claims come out coherent as well. So two interpretations we just discussed are demonstrably, inarguably incoherent. Two others are pretty clearly heretical. How many of these four disambiguations of their little formulas do they discuss? None at all. Now there is literature done by analytic theologians, which tries to give other coherent interpretations to these seven claims. I just talked about four obvious ones, but those aren't all the interpretations. But these authors seem to not know anything about this whole literature. There's not one reference anywhere in this book to any piece of analytic theology. And so they just pass on this kind of piece of lore. Hey, there's these seven claims. That's what the doctrine is. As I discussed last episode, it's not even clear it is only seven claims, but let that go for now. By passing on these seven ambiguous statements, they seem to think that they've clearly expressed a single doctrine, a single view about the one God. But they haven't. So what do they really think the Trinity means? Right? They know about the language that there's one usia and three hypostases, or one essence or nature and three persons that have it. In some sense, there's supposed to be a triune God here. Help. How do we interpret this? The discerning reader has just obtained mostly a headache from this little stab at clarifying the doctrine. Now, one thing they strongly emphasize in the first chapter is that you have to understand the divine division of labor. The different persons do different things in you know, the economy of salvation. Okay, if that's important to understand their different activities, different jobs, different roles, that suggests that they think there are really three selves there, three intelligent agents, three actors. So are they social Trinitarians? Do they think these are really selves and not just modes or something else? On this and that page, one starts to think this. And yet, very frequently, they revert to language that sounds vehemently like a one-self trinity. Now, let me just turn on my little one-self language detector here. It'll give a little ding whenever there's a piece of language which is normally used to express a single self. They write on page 40, He is indeed one God, triune, but he is three persons, 
He is indeed one God, triune, emphasizing the un, but he is three persons, triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then you look on a different page, 21, and here's the division of labor. I also have a handy little piece of software here that when it hears language that would normally be used to express multiple selves, it gives a little buzz. But they start the passage with one self-talk. So they say, the Trinity is not an abstraction, but a living, working, creator-redeemer. Hmm. God is who he is in his triune being for our salvation. Okay, here's the division of labor. We are chosen by God the Father in Christ the Son through God the Spirit. Or, as we have already noted, salvation is administered by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Spirit. To express the same truths in yet another way, the salvation that was planned by the Father has been procured by the Son and is now presented and protected by the Spirit. Whatever words we use to describe it, the point is that our salvation from sin depends on a gracious cooperation within the Godhead. Now about that term Godhead, this is a strange feature of recent Trinitarian discourse. Godhead is an outdated English translation of Greek and Latin terms that would be better translated as the divine nature or the divine essence. Godhead in contemporary Trinitarian discourse, as I understand it, it's a plural referring expression used to refer to the three as such. So they'll say, you know, the Son plays this and that role within the Godhead. So among the three of them, there's this one of them who does a particular thing. I think the people that use the term are presupposing that the three in some sense are one God or they're in one God and yet they want to refer to them as three. That's the point of this term, Godhead. In being a plural referring term is like the term gang or group or family. Okay, so what is the doctrine really? Uh, who knows? I mean, the Trinity is clearly a he for them, and yet they seem to think about it half the time as if it's a they, and they give this language that they do not care to disambiguate. And that's about all that can be said. So this question, what is the doctrine of the Trinity, they do address it at some length, but they address it in a way that's going to leave a discerning reader at least as confused as when they started. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what about the tritheism and incoherence issues? Another fundamental question about, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity is, why is this doctrine not, as some allege, tritheism? Why isn't it really just belief in three gods? Just look at the Nicene Creed. It talks about true God from true God. How many true gods is that? It looks like two. Two true gods presumably would be two gods, one of which eternally causes the other, it says. Add in the Holy Spirit, and then you would have three gods, not merely one or two. This question they do answer on page 41. Unfortunately, it's merely an assertion. They write, They are not three beings, three gods, but one indivisible being, one God. Okay, do you trust them that much? Are you going to just stand for just a mere assertion? It's not clear they even appreciate the force of the objection at all. Now, just before this passage, they had written that all three persons are fully divine because they share in one essential being. And then they went on to the sentence I quoted a second ago. So I think they're assuming that just the nature sharing or the essence sharing somehow makes them the same God. And this is confirmed by what they say on page 96. 
you know, being reformed, they're fundamentally Augustinians in their thinking, and they like to give friendly quotations from Augustine here and there. This is a quotation from Augustine's book on the Trinity, in which he writes, The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit intimate a divine unity of one and the same substance in an indivisible equality, and therefore that they are not three gods, but one God. Okay, so credit to them for, I think, implicitly answering this question. Is it a good answer? I don't think so. What's a common philosophical example of two different things that share a nature? Well, my friend, it would be you and me. We share human nature. But our sharing human nature doesn't make us one human. So it's unclear why sharing the divine nature would make these three persons into the same God. A lot more, I think, would have to be said about what a nature involves to make that answer stick. But let's move on to the next question, which is closely related to the previous two questions. It is, why is this doctrine not, as some allege, incoherent? In other words, why doesn't it imply at least one contradiction, at least one sentence of the form P and not P? If it does imply a contradiction, then it can't be that all of these claims are true. That's just logic. This they do explicitly address. They call it the logical question. Now you know going into this, it's going to be a bumpy ride, because earlier in the book they write this. One of the most careful explanations of the doctrine of the Trinity comes from, wait for it, the Athanasian Creed, which was written around A.D. 400. (laughs) Most careful, huh? Wow. I mean... Never mind that the Athanasian Creed isn't by Athanasius and isn't by a council. What's important to see about the Athanasian Creed is before it gets around to damning everybody who won't go along with this, it sets out what on the face of it is a self-contradictory doctrine. They quote the phrase, and yet they are not three eternals but one eternal, and they quote that the Godhead, the divine nature of the three, is the same. Fine. What they don't quote from the Athanasian Creed is that which, when added, makes the whole thing seem self-contradictory or incoherent, and that's that there are differences between the three. The tradition is the Father doesn't come from anything else, the Son eternally comes from the Father, and Spirit eternally comes from the Father or the Father and the Son. Okay, well, those differences entail that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Father is not the Spirit. There really are three things there, because eternally they differ from one another. Okay, then if each is eternal, there are three eternals. But this says, guess what? There's only one eternal. If each one of those things is fully divine, there are three fully divine things. This creed says there's only one. So they're not too worried about this, but they know this is a common objection, so they want to take it on. The first thing they do is they just gesture at what I call the standard opening move. You know, we're not saying three persons and one person. We're not saying three beings and one being. We're saying one being and three persons. Okay, that's just out of the top drawer of the apologist playbook. It doesn't really go very far because you would think a person is a being. It's an intelligent, thinking, acting being. They say something that makes it sound like they think the persons of the Trinity are actually parts of the one God. They write, think about this in mathematical terms. One could say that P plus P plus P equals G. That is, three persons constitute one God and be completely logical. Well, sure. If you think the one God has three parts and those parts are these three persons, then that's not incoherent. Is that their answer? Uh, I mean, it's unclear. If that's what they think the persons of the Trinity are, three proper parts of the whole that is the one God, that's your answer to the incoherence question right there. It looks like then you'd have to say that only the one God has the divine nature because everywhere in this book they talk about the divine nature as implying triunity. Okay, so then the Father wouldn't have the divine nature, not really, but only the whole trinity would. Looks like they'd have to go in that direction, like apologist and analytic theologian William Lane Craig If that's your answer, then you should just pay the price and try to deal with the consequences. But they don't seem to realize that this is an answer to the incoherence question, because they go on squid style to squirt out a big cloud of black ink. They strongly emphasize that, hey, this doctrine is super weird, it's just odd, 
that's unlike anything in human experience. You can't give any good analogy to it, and moreover, we're just unable to comprehend it. I guess that's supposed to excuse our authors from needing to clearly communicate what it is. That can't be done, not because we're confused or because we haven't studied this hard enough, but just, hey, it's beyond all human comprehension. You know, all the smartest people in the world with all the divine revelation in the world, they couldn't do such a thing. So yeah, that's why we can't do it. What they're pounding the table about is what I've called in print negative mysterianism. You just make the claims that supposedly constitute the doctrine of the Trinity so uninterpretable, so thin, so slim in meaning that a person couldn't derive any contradiction from that language because they're really kind of just at a loss to interpret it. Page 67, they write, but God's triune nature will always remain mysterious. Hmm. Interesting claim. How would a person go about knowing that, I wonder? It is not the intention of this chapter to explain God's triunity. In fact, it is commonly said that everyone in history who tried to explain the Trinity ended up being branded a heretic. Right, so maybe it's dangerous to even try to clarify it. Scripture does not present this doctrine in a manner that satisfies our curiosity, you and your curious mind. You see? You see? Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! Instead, it teaches us just enough about God's triune nature to increase our astonishment and awe of Him. The point of this chapter has been to show that there is nothing illogical or theologically inconsistent about God's being three in one. Having come to that conclusion, the mystery remains. But now, instead of a mystery that causes us to doubt, we see that God's triunity is a mystery that leads us to worship. Augustine wisely reminds us, What is needed is a loving confession of ignorance rather than a rash profession of knowledge. To reach a little toward God with the mind is a greater blessedness, yet to understand is wholly impossible. In this chapter, we have reached a little toward God with the mind. But the purpose of such an exercise is not to satisfy questions. Rather, it is to clear away distractions and promote awe and worship. So it's a distraction to wonder just what this doctrine is that they would like us to agree with. I mean, they're right about this. Language that can't be understood can't be understood to be incoherent. And so that's the protective function of this heavy negative mysterianism. Like many other authors, they appeal to modern physics. You know, hey, just that it's weird is no hit against it. Physics is full of weird things. Page 46. Like astrophysics and quantum physics, theology takes us into realms of reality beyond normal this-worldly natures. When we study the very nature of God's being and make observations concerning the kind of being that he is, we should not be surprised at findings that are nothing like our experiences of other beings in the everyday encounters of our world. The discovery that God is triune is certainly one such finding. It is an anomaly, but it is not illogical. Nor is it to be dismissed as untrue because we cannot comprehend it. Rather, just as physicists examine the evidence of their fields to establish their doctrines about nature, the claim that God is triune has to be tested against what is revealed about him, and if the evidence sustains it, it must be accepted reverently. But unlike physics, which studies material phenomena, theologians study an immaterial God who cannot be examined through experiments with a telescope or microscope. The only infallible evidence we possess for knowing God is his self-revelation in Scripture. It is, therefore, through the exegetical study of Scripture that the theologian must discern what is true about God, even if it stretches our mind beyond what we can fully comprehend. Recent physics is indeed filled with bizarre and confusing claims. That can't be denied. However, things like quantum mechanics have a strong empirical confirmation. That's why scientists are willing to accept these theories even with their difficult-to-interpret claims. What the comparison implies is that in the case of the Trinity too, there is very strong confirmation of this whatever-it-is doctrine from Scripture. 
Now, it's hard to see how this is going to be because the content of the doctrine is so obscure. How would you know whether or not it's being implied by written sources? But that's what they're claiming. When the Trinity's podcast returns, their answers as to when and where God reveals this baffling doctrine. Another fundamental question is, when, if ever, did God reveal this doctrine? And their answer is basically that it's revealed in the New Testament, although there is some divine plurality in the Old Testament. And in this section, they have some good comments against over-reading Old Testament passages, really kind of shoehorning in ideas which are clearly not in the text. Call it dishonest overreach by interpreters. This is really common with present-day evangelical apologists. One could certainly accuse them of overreach and how they treat certain passages. But let me move on to the next question. And this would be the fundamental question, I think, for a lot of readers of a book like this, and indeed for a lot of listeners to the Trinity's podcast. The question is, if this doctrine is in the Bible, how can one see this? Don't tell me it's there. Show me how it's there. Now, this is going to be hard on the face of it because they haven't clearly said what it is. And so, how are we going to know if it is implied by the text when we can't give any clear meaning to the component claims of it? They've really left, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity kind of as a black box into which one cannot see. Let's just spot them, though, a vague idea of there's a triune God, there's a tripersonal God. Whatever that means, oh, maybe it can't be clarified, okay, but let's just stick with that very vague concept, with that very vague image, and see how they show us, supposedly, that this is in the text of Scripture. In a sense, they don't tackle this directly, but what they do in chapter 2 is they say, well, just look at the passages we discuss in the other chapters, in chapters 1, 3, and 4. There's where the Trinity is. Just look at those passages. Hmm, okay. So, in chapter 4, they focus on the baptism of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. It's a short passage. Let's just go ahead and read it and see when we come to the triune God part. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. All right, so there's three somethings here. The speaker of the voice is unnamed, but obviously it's the Father, also known as God. There's Jesus, the man, also called the Son of God. And there's a mention of the Holy Spirit, whatever that is. It comes down. Here's in part what they say about this episode. Luke seems to be less interested in the baptism itself. In fact, he does not even describe how the baptism took place or the person who performed it. Then he was in what happened afterward. What attracted Luke's attention was the revelation of God in his triune being. All three persons of the Trinity were present at this baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, this is just a gleeful anachronism. This idea that the three of them are one God or persons in the one God is from the fourth century. And they're like, see, this is what Luke is talking about. Well, Luke doesn't say that, right? Nowhere in the book does Luke say anything remotely resembling what I just read to you. They just don't care about anachronism, I think. They have this doctrine in mind. They're going to find it here. Now, I know this is a tempting passage for a Trinitarian to point at, because there are the three of them not exactly named, but the three things are mentioned here, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But here's the thing. 
There's nothing in the text that portrays them as the one God, or as persons within the one God. In fact, the whole thing just seems to assume, like the rest of the book and like the book of Acts, that the one true God just is the Father himself. And to say that the Spirit here is portrayed as a divine person is, on the face of it, an overreading. The Spirit doesn't do anything here that requires it to be a person. It or he just comes down in some kind of bird-like fashion. Movies will portray this as like a dove that comes down and lands on Jesus' shoulder. It doesn't exactly say that. It says it comes down in bodily form like a dove. It doesn't really clarify, but the point is that nothing is said that requires the Spirit to be a person. A person, yes, might come down upon Jesus, but also so could a power or a force or a manifestation of God or something like that. So there's not on the part of the Holy Spirit as they write, quote, a public declaration that he was with Jesus for his ministry. A different way to put it is there aren't clearly three characters here. There are at least two, God and Jesus, but there's not clearly a third. So if you just gesture at this passage and say, look, there's the Trinity, that's not good enough. The most the Trinitarian can say is that this passage is consistent with God being the Trinity. Yeah, maybe, but it's also clearly consistent with, you know, biblical Unitarian views, on which Jesus is a man, the one true God is the Father alone, and the Holy Spirit is like God's power given to believers and given to prophets and given to God's human Messiah. It looks like in treating this passage, they've committed a sort of fallacy, which I call the C3 fallacy. You just observe the three mentioned there, and you conclude, aha, there's the triune God. But the Father, Son, and Spirit, in some sense being active at the same time, that's consistent with modalism, that's consistent with subordinationism, that's consistent with any sort of Unitarian view. The only view it rules out would be a strictly one after the other, a strictly serial kind of modalism where, you know, first God is Father, then that stops, and then God is the Son, and that stops, and then then God is the Spirit. That's the only view that a scene like that rules out. No, but who cares about that view? That's not plausible. I think they commit the same fallacy in pointing us at the opening to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The three are mentioned here. Okay, but where's the triune God part? Let's listen to this. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Hmm, did you catch that? Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. So, on the face of it, the one God here is the Father, and moreover, he's the God of the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. The Holy Spirit is not clearly a person. It's a seal that God has marked us with. Could you describe a divine person as a seal? You could, although the language would suggest something that's not a person, not a self. But if you're just, you know, kind of scanning for the words, Father, Son, Spirit, boom, they're there. That's the C3 fallacy. Aha, that's the triune God right there, I tell you. Well... 
the passage seems to make perfect sense without the author's confused ideas about a triune God. So why would we impose that idea on this passage? And this passage isn't unique, it's just like the rest of Paul's writings. See Trinity's podcast 253, The Apostle Paul, a Unitarian. In chapter 3 of their book, they riff on John chapters 13 through 17. Their topic is really the practicality of the Trinity, you know, how doggone helpful it is, which just presupposes that it's true, whatever it is. Do their comments on these four chapters either add any clarity or somehow support these dark sayings? As one would expect, they emphasize that in these chapters, personal language is used of God's Spirit. Strikingly so. Of course, the question is, how do we make sense of that in the context of all scriptural talk of God's Spirit? Your spirit and my spirit, these are not additional selves, right? Why then would we think that God's Spirit is someone in addition to the Father? One thing they get into here, which further muddies the water, is the issue of worship. Whenever they go with Scripture, it seems like it doesn't fit very well with their Trinitarian speculations. One thing they say is that the ultimate, the farthest back object of worship is the Father. Yeah, that's the New Testament view. Paul says in Philippians 2 that every knee will bow to Jesus, and this will be to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus is worshipped in Revelation 5, presumably this is to the glory of God who's worshipped with him and who's first portrayed alone in chapter 4. They write, we also worship the Son and the Spirit, and we also worship, they say, the three in one. Now, here the careful Bible reader should have questions. There isn't any passage in the Bible where the three in one is worshipped. If you think there is, please inform us where that passage is. Leave us a comment on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Nor is there any passage in the Bible where the Holy Spirit is an object of worship. Both of those facts are surprising if God is the Trinity. For one thing, if the three are equally divine, you'd expect equally the three to be worshipped. On the other hand, if the one God is the Trinity, you'd expect the Trinity to be worshipped. Worship is an I-thou relation. It's a relation between a self and another self. And really, there are four potential recipients of worship here. I mean, not in the Bible, but given some sort of triune God theory, there's the Trinity, if that's a self. They're totally unclear about that. And then the persons, if they're selves, then they would be three different objects of worship, it looks like. Are they really selves? They're totally unclear about that. Now, I think to make the book more devotional, they like to quote various Trinitarian hymns, and these hymns display a total chaos about how many selves there are in the Trinity, and so there's chaos about how many recipients of worship there are in this Trinity. At the start of the book, they quote an anonymous 18th century hymn that says, To the great one in three, eternal praises be, hence evermore. His sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. By making the one in three, that is, the triune God, an object of worship, that presupposes that the triune God is a self. It's a he, it's a him, it can be addressed, it, or rather he, can receive worship. At the start of another chapter, they reproduce an anonymous 10th century hymn, which translated is, Father most holy, merciful, and loving. Okay, there's one self being addressed there in a worshipful manner. Yesu, Jesus, Redeemer, ever to be worshipped. Okay, so there's another one we're worshipping. Life-giving spirit, comforter most gracious. There's a third object of worship. God everlasting. God, presumably being the Trinity, So in this one, it looks like there's four objects of worship, which would seem to assume four selves, the three persons plus the triune God. And yet at the end of the book, we're back to one self-language. Quoting another author, they have, This triunion is the secret of God's most infinite life and being, into which, in his infinite love and generosity, he has admitted us, and is therefore to be accepted with amazed and exultant gratitude. So may God give us joyful amazement and eternal gratitude for the glorious mystery of his triune being. That's how the book ends. 
But yeah, when they're sticking to the Bible, they sound like Unitarians, that the ultimate object of worship is God, the Father. Clearly, we worship the Son, too. That's in Scripture. But then they add in these other claims. They also seem to endorse a biblical Unitarian understanding of prayer. On page 75, they write, The prevailing pattern of prayer in the Bible is to address the Father in the name of the Son by the help of the Holy Spirit. Right. That's because the Father is supposed to be the one true God in the New Testament. Now, they write just before that, We have examples of prayer to other members of the Godhead in Scripture. For example, Acts 7, 59-60. Well, in doing that, they fake it. That one reference is when Stephen is being stoned and he addresses the Lord Jesus, who he sees in heaven exalted to the right hand of God. Prayer in the New Testament, yes, is mainly to the Father, that is to God. Jesus, too, can be addressed. There are some fairly clear passages on that where either it's stated or presupposed. What about the Holy Spirit? As far as I can tell, the Holy Spirit is never prayed to. So it's just hand-waving and fakery to say that there are examples in Scripture of prayer to other members of the Godhead, in other words, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, As far as I know, there isn't any prayer to the Holy Spirit in Scripture. If you think that's mistaken, leave us a comment on the blog post for this episode. When the Trinity's podcast returns, the myth of the three eternal and perfect amigos. One thing they don't notice is prominent places in the writings of John where a Trinitarian would expect to find three, but John only gives us two. So on page 80, they notice in John 14, 22, and 23, the author writes, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and the Father will love him, and we, in other words, Jesus and the Father, will come to him and make our home with him. And that should make you remember John 17, 3, where Jesus is praying and he says that eternal life is to know you, the Father, the one true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. Or in 1 John 1, 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with, drum roll please, this would be a great place to throw in the three of them, right? Nope, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Hmm, somebody seems to be missing in action there. That's not what a Trinitarian would expect. But like many other authors, they hit us with what I call the myth of the three eternal amigos. Page 92. From all eternity, the three persons have enjoyed perfect love within the Godhead. So, eternally long in the Trinity, in the triune God, there are three persons who have enjoyed perfect love with one another. Really, the discerning reader looks in vain for a scriptural reference there. Where are they pulling that out of? I don't know, it just looks like complete speculation. And this is a point that's commonly overlooked. This theme of eternal perfect friendship just isn't in scripture anywhere. Even if you can argue that Jesus existed before the creation and God created through him, how do you even get eternal existence for the Son? It looks like you don't. It's presupposed by people, but it's not actually a scriptural theme. Nor is the eternality of this Spirit, who is a third person, a person in distinction from the Father and the Son. So... Yeah, there's a lot of casual anachronism, just reading later ideas back into these New Testament texts. There's the C3 fallacy, just because these three are mentioned, aha, this is where they're talking about the triune God, but you never actually see the triune God part in the text. There's this beguiling image of this eternal perfect friendship, which just floats free of any scriptural support. And they seem completely insensitive to features of the text that would make you think that the Son is not God. As they point out, he doesn't do miracles by his own power. He does them by God's power given to him. Hmm, wouldn't seem like God would need to do that. 
Jesus in the New Testament gets credit for obeying God. Does God obey God? Jesus gets tempted. Can you tempt God? What does the New Testament say? Jesus dies. Can God die? They make just a very short gesture at a two natures solution to these kinds of problems, but they don't seem to really realize that they are problems. Okay, what other passages do they gesture at? The transfiguration in Luke chapter 9. They say, look, he just suddenly reveals his deity for a minute. He like pulls back the veil. Look, why would you read that in that way? Commenters point out that when Moses you know, meets God, it is close to God on the mountain, that he comes back down and he's shining and his appearance has changed. Hmm, that seems like a rather obvious help in interpreting this text. They write about this episode that Luke gives us another glimpse of affection and approval within the Trinity when he shows us Jesus' transfiguration. <sighs> okay, in the text, God, that's the speaker of the voice that comes out of the cloud, God approves of the Son of God. There's no reason to think this is within an eternal Trinity. The Holy Spirit's not mentioned. And Luke doesn't draw any conclusions from the incident like this. Moreover, as they point out, another New Testament book seems to comment on this episode. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16-18 through 18 says, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, in other words, Jesus' majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So, this author is supposed to be Peter. He doesn't draw any such conclusions about these three eternal amigos. It looks like they're just imposing it on the text. Now, maybe the most ridiculous example of imposing Trinity ideas on the text occurs in their treatment of Luke chapter 10. This is where Jesus sends out 70 disciples, and they come back after having some success, and they say, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. Jesus said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay, so this is a celebration of the spreading of the kingdom through Jesus' disciples. Jesus has seen the kingdom advance. And then the text continues in this way. At that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Referring to his disciples, of course. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then, turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. But I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Okay, so they're witnessing prophecy coming true. It's the kingdom going forth. But they see, mentioned, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and they're like, Aha, there's the triune God, whatever that is. They write, here Jesus rejoices in the Spirit and in the Father, and as he rejoices, we catch a glimpse of God glorifying and enjoying himself. There can be no greater joy than this, the reciprocal and eternal joy that God himself enjoys in the being of God. God's chief end is to glorify himself and enjoy himself forever. On this occasion, Jesus was so overwhelmed with triune joy that <laughs> triune joy, that in a spontaneous outburst he rejoiced out loud. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, finding his enjoyment in the third person of the Trinity. He also rejoiced in the Father, praising him for his supreme greatness over heaven and earth. Again, does this text imply, does it even suggest that the Holy Spirit is a person? It looks like the meaning here would be that Jesus is just, you know, experiencing a surge of divine power. He's really feeling the Spirit, and it's causing him to rejoice. 
it's like back in chapter 1, verse 41, when Luke writes about John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, etc. So, not just prophets, but believers, and especially a very special human servant who's even greater than any prophet, the Messiah, sometimes they just are filled to overflowing with God's power, and they speak inspired words. And it looks like that's what Luke is writing about here. That's an easy way to understand rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Notice he only addresses the Father. He doesn't address the Holy Spirit. And it looks like it's just imposing your precious speculation on the text to make the Holy Spirit a personal object of adoration here or praise. It's just not there. When the Trinity's podcast returns, some concluding thoughts. Authors seem to be free of any worry that, quote, the Trinity is not actually in the Bible. They're incapable of telling us what this doctrine amounts to. They, in effect, reproduce just some standard lore about it that, hey, look, here's seven claims. Isn't that good? And hey, we're not saying God is three in one in the same sense, so that eh, can't be contradictory. In so doing, they don't really go beyond just your kind of average mangy internet apologist. And their exegesis is disturbing. It's just striking throughout the book how hard they try to shoehorn triune God ideas into texts where those ideas don't seem to be needed, number one, and number two, they don't seem to fit. The texts don't mention the Trinity as God. They don't portray the Father, Son, and Spirit as the one God or persons within God or being the same God. They just talk unselfconsciously about God being the same one as the Father, those seem to be co-referring expressions in the New Testament. And yes, I know that arguably a few times in the New Testament, Jesus is called God. On that, see podcast 224, Biblical Words for God and His Son, Part 1, God and, quote, God in the Bible. When it comes to anachronism, taking later ideas and projecting them into earlier times when they were never thought of, Unfortunately, our authors are terrible sinners. Reading this book kind of reminds me of reading Roman Catholic interpreters before the Reformation who would just assert that Peter was the first pope based on the discussion in Matthew 16 about the keys of the kingdom and maybe act as if no one ever questioned or denied such a reading. Now, in fact, there's nothing about that text which refers to the papacy or even a monarchical system of bishops. And by history, we know that this was a later development. It's just barely getting going in the 100s. It's still developing in the 200s. It's kind of fully in place in the 300s. That's what historians tell us. So we can be pretty sure that the author of the Gospel according to Matthew is not telling us that Jesus made Peter the first pope. Guys, I've studied this a lot. Based on many years of slogging through all of the available early sources, I can tell you that if you exclude the modalistic monarchians, I don't find any triune God idea in Christian history until the second half of the 300s. There is talk of the Trinity earlier than that, but it's just a plural referring expression for the one true God, the Father, and also this in some sense divine logos, and this in some sense divine spirit. So in these early uses of the Greek word trios and the Latin word trinitas, the meaning is a triad not a triune God. If I'm right about this, then the doctrine of the Trinity is no more in the New Testament than the idea of the internet is in the writings of Thomas Jefferson. If you look at the writings of Thomas Jefferson and say, aha, I've discovered his plan for the internet, it's not discovery, it's just a projection. 
it seems to me that that's the quality of discovery and insight that's offered in this book. Put differently, what this book can teach you is how at least Reformed Trinitarians look at the Bible. It's not a pretty picture. The theory seems wholly undeveloped, completely confused, and then they're just finding this confusion supposedly in the text. But the thing is, it just doesn't seem to be there. It's not explicitly there, it's not implicitly there, and it doesn't seem like it's required to make sense of what is there. So finally, based on my nine questions, I'm going to give this book a score. And of course, I've just ignored the 10 advanced questions. You can't expect a book of only 114 pages to get into the advanced questions. Okay, but how many of the nine fundamental questions did they answer? What's the doctrine of the Trinity? They try on that and completely fail to say anything coherent. Second, why is this doctrine not as some alleged tritheism? I think they clearly enough imply an answer to this. And the answer is, this isn't tritheism because there's just one divine nature or essence involved. I'm not sure why anyone should think that's a sufficient answer, but it is a clear answer, so I'll give them that. Why is this doctrine not, as some allege, incoherent? Again, you leave more confused than you went in. Is this doctrine consistent with the common conception of a God as a mighty, unique, and completely perfect self? They don't address that. When, if ever, did God reveal this doctrine? They do clearly answer that. They say it's in the New Testament. If this doctrine is in the Bible, how can one see this? By just gesturing, I think it's wholly, completely unconvincing. If you're already a Trinitarian, you might nod your head to some of this, and you might also see how anachronistic a lot of it is at the same time. If you're not a Trinitarian, you won't find anything here to move you. There just isn't any convincing argument on that score. And it's not only unconvincing, but it's really completely unclear as well. Question 7 is not relevant because they do think the Trinity is in the Bible. Question 8, how does this doctrine relate to the so-called ecumenical creeds? No, they don't get into that. Why have some Christians opposed any Trinity doctrine? A complete and perfect miss on that. 10. Is this doctrine, as the Athanasian Creed asserts, something which one must believe in order to be saved? They do give their answer to that, the traditional Catholic answer. So it looks like they clearly answer just three of the nine questions, and so that's the score I have to give the book. I wish I could be more positive. Hopefully I will be more positive in some of the coming episodes. Next week, a more learned and very different introduction to the Trinity. This week's thinking music has been the track High Above the Darkness, My Star by Admiral Bob. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>